Okay, welcome everybody. My name is James Zabrowski. I serve as the Executive Director for Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization. And if this is your first time joining us in our third installment of our annual Business Formation Bootcamp, I would like to welcome you and tell you briefly about what our organization does and why we exist. Our mission is to inform, support, and inspire college students to be more entrepreneurial via new venture creation. Uh, and we do this by operating and helping to support entrepreneurship clubs at over 250 different universities nationwide and overseas. Uh, we also offer a what is now a $20,000 global pitch competition, uh, an annual conference, um, and individual programming through our on-campus chapters. Uh, this boot camp is designed to help students that have an entrepreneurial mindset move forward in the business formation and ideation process. It is roughly structured around design thinking and its underlying purpose is to help a student that has an entrepreneurial mind or would like to launch an entrepreneurial business um, get to a feasible idea. Uh, we have gone through creativity and opportunity recognition. We've addressed ideation and creating a solution for the problem. And today we're going to talk a little bit about concept viability. Uh, so what does it mean to make sure that the venture is moving in the right direction and has a little bit of traction behind it? Um, this program has been occurring over the past several weeks. We have one more installment next week, and that's going to be evaluating customers. Do you have what they want and what they're looking for? Today, we have a really exciting lineup um, and several different segments to our boot camp. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to hear a brief announcement from Future Founders. Future Founders is a very important partner of Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization that works to advance the individual entrepreneur. So whereas CEO focuses on creating that community to support entrepreneurs on your college or university campus, Future Founders works one on one with these individuals to provide resources and help them move their venture into the market um, and into the industry. Then we're going to dive a little bit deeper on our underlying topic for today uh, with our feature presenter, Chris Culver, on the topic of business vi viability, uh, his entrepreneurial journey and the methodology behind his book, The Aspiring Solopreneur. And finally, we're gonna wrap up today's segment with the uh, Business Formation Bootcamp with a brief introduction to Open Ocean, which is a new software designed to help the entrepreneur walk through the step-by-step -step process of creating and understanding a meaningful feasibility analysis. Uh, so what I'd like to do at this point in time is introduce you to Sal, who is the Senior Startups Manager with Future Founders, so that he can talk about an exciting program that all of you can participate in. Sal? Thanks, James. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sal, Senior Startups Manager at Future Founders. Um, excited to talk to all of you today about our uh, premier founder accelerator, the Startup Boot Camp. So Future Founders uh, is a nonprofit that believes in building the next generation of entrepreneurs. And so we started this startup boot camp as a founder development accelerator, where we work with idea stage founders uh, in their 20s to help them start and then scale their businesses. We are interested in the founder, not, not the business. So we don't invest in companies. We don't charge for our services. We're funded through sponsorships and generous donors. And so if you apply to our, our boot camp and you, you'd be accepted, we're very invested, as James said, in your development as a founder. Um, so that means you get access to like workshops, speakers, uh, network, tailored mentorship opportunities. Um, and it turns into this very um, like successful peer community where you're around other people going through the journey um, as well. So uh, as James mentioned, CEO is um, a very strong and like awesome partner uh, with Future Founders. And we love working with CEO participants. Um, many participants from CEO have gone on to be a part of Future Founders. Um, and gone on to like have success with their business as well. Collectively, all of our founders, the past eight years, we've worked, this is collectively about hundred of these founders have generated over $140 million in revenue, um, raised over $80 million in capital and created over a thousand jobs. Um, so we really like working with founders from CEO. A lot of them helped uh, uh, have success with those stats as well and contribute to those stats. So what we can offer you as CEO participants uh, is you get to skip the application process if you're interested. 
Um, so I have this interest form here. Anybody on this call, any participant or CEO can fill this out and you don't have to fill out an application to our startup bootcamp. You get to skip the application process, go straight to the interview, uh, where we'll be able to meet each other on a call and we can hear about what you're working on. You don't, all you need is an idea to get started. You don't even need to have revenue to be a part of this or be a strong candidate. We just want to hear about what you're working on, your commitment to the idea, and see if we can help support you along your journey. So consider me a resource for you. I'm going to put my email in the chat as well. If you have any questions about this program, um, if you want to know more, if you want anything clarified, feel free to reach out via email. Also feel free to fill out the interest form and we'll be in touch from there. So I have to see a lot of you um, in the Startup Bootcamp and I'm excited to um, learn more about your journeys. Thank you, Sal. I really appreciate that. Um, I can speak from my participation in Future Founders as a mentor. Um, this is a really meaningful opportunity for students that are ready and looking forward to launching ventures. Um, Future Founders really helps move that needle forward in ways that CEO cannot. Uh, so thanks, Sal. I appreciate um, you kind of sharing that uh, amazing opportunity with our members. Uh, so at this time, I would like to introduce you to our featured presenter. Uh, today, uh, we have a seasoned entrepreneur with more than 30 years of experience who started his first of 14 companies at the age of 19. Since then, he has been involved in businesses ranging from business consulting to real estate, online services, consulting, advertising, financial services, and many more. As a former business broker and a current strategic advisor and mentor, he has seen the inner workings of hundreds of businesses, some good, some ugly, but all interesting. Through his many experiences, he has gained a unique understanding, appreciation, and love for solo entrepreneurship along with a genuine passion for helping others achieve their dreams. I'm excited to welcome Chris Culver as our featured presenter today. And Chris, do you mind to just introduce yourself a little bit further to uh, our guests uh, at this moment? You bet, James. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm humbled to be here and I'm uh, grateful for your, for your time and interest. Um, as James pointed out, yeah, I started my first and it's actually 16 companies now. Uh -huh. uh, I've built them, bought them, sold them, wrecked them. Um, I, I understand it. It's what I'm built to do. Last year, uh, as a senior advisor to the CEO that I talk with a couple times a week, we took the company public in the cryptocurrency space. Um, I've had multiple, multiple companies that we've gone from, we've actually 10x their top line as well as their bottom line revenues. <clears throat> um, I have thousands of hours of facilitation under my belt. And uh, I love helping people break through ceilings and figure out how to break through to, to what that next level is. Uh, as James pointed out, I'm a big fan of the, the solopreneur world. I think the gig economy is the, is the future and it's expanding dramatically. Uh, I wrote a best-selling book on that, The Aspiring Solopreneur, as well as I just had a new book that came out a couple of weeks ago, um, Living Life on Your Terms, it's my fifth, but it's specifically to help people define success on a different basis. So often we abdicate the definition of what success is to others. And this allows you to take a holistic approach and define it on your terms, not according to maybe the scarcity mindsets of your parents or the insecurities of your peers, but on your terms. Uh, I now get to live uh, half time in, uh, in Nebraska and I spend a good chunk of my time in the high country of Colorado where I am today, about 30 miles south of Vail. Um, and it, it's just the biggest treat. I get to, uh, I worked with a leadership team this morning for, for five hours coaching that was based out of the UK. I flew private to Austin last week, was in Savannah the week before helping, uh, helping people figure out new, new directions. So. Chris, that's awesome. Let's start here. Um, how did you, so age 19, you dive into this entrepreneurial journey of yours. Um, at what point did you feel uh, like you were on the entrepreneurial path? Um, we often talk about how entrepreneurs uh, start uh, launching businesses, and um, sometimes it's just a happenstance. Um, did you set out to be an entrepreneur at that age, or uh, was this something that uh, came to you through osmosis, we'll say? I, I had done, I'd been entrepreneurial in one sense or another from, you know, mowing lawns and shoveling driveways and you know, doing different things throughout. But it was, um, it was when I started my first company, Full Corporation, 
doing uh, clothing design, manufacturing, wholesale, and also did soft goods in that space. And it was, it was, uh, it's when I decided to do that, but that was in the eighties. And in the eighties, entrepreneurship was a dirty word. Mm -hmm. If you decided, if you said you were an entrepreneur, it's not celebrated the way it is now. It mm -hmm. meant that in essence, you were going to be ostracized and that you weren't going to be able to go out and get a corporate job. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I made a note. It's kind of funny. I was actually the predecessor to CEO was uh, ACE, the Association of Collegiate Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, president of my chapter of ACE in 1986. Wow. So, yeah. You know, there's, there's good juice for, uh, for what you guys are doing. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well, today's topic um, is really addressing that uh, viability or feasibility element of entrepreneurship. Um, and as I mentioned, when I started discussing today's segment, um, we've gone through the ideation process, we've identified problems that could potentially spin up uh, into ventures. Um, since we've, we've gone through those processes, have you uh, any experience? Um, it, what do you do to go through the ideation process? How do you um, sit down and help uh, one of your clients or maybe yourself as you're uh, looking at launching new ventures? You know, what's your approach to that, Chris? Well, I think um, it's an area that I, I can't tell you how often I see people get complete, they get analysis paralysis. Yeah. Um, it's the last 20% so often that people get completely wrapped around the axle. So I believe that, that it's a matter of, of doing quick revolutions. Uh, I'm not a, a huge fan of the, the term fail fast. I, I prefer to think of it as learn fast. And, and through that process, we may have different iterations. But I like to, I like to, to try and, and first put myself in the position of who, who am I trying to solve? What is the issue I'm trying to solve? And put yourself in that person's seat. And then try and get it close not done. If you can get it 70, 80% of the way there, then go start talking to people and say, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. Here's where I'm at. This is what I'm doing. I'm two thirds of the way down the road. What do you think? What would you like? Because I can't tell you how often you can, you can go through and build an entire idea out and you think you've got it dialed and you get ready to present it. And then people are like, yeah, but I wish it were blue or no, yeah. I wish it were taller or no, I wish it did this. Mm -hmm. But if you can talk to people early on, it does two things. One, well, first off in the ideation process, find out if somebody else is already doing it. You may even be able to actually license it and see if somebody else is there. But how is the problem being solved? Is it a viable, is it scalable? Is it big? Are there things there? I've helped, you know, I've, I've had a few exits. I've helped a lot of people have big exits. And the intention is, is, is what is the problem? How is it being solved? And then how are you going to do it better? But trying to completely reinvent the wheel rarely works. You know, we hear that, we celebrate it, but that isn't really the case. It's pretty rare. So if you get pretty close with an idea or concept, minimum viable con, you know, MVP, and then present that and go, go to potential champions and say, look, I am not selling you anything. Put that right up front. I would love to get your feedback on something. Then you're asking for their help. Mm -hmm. James, if I came to you and said, James, I got something that's the greatest thing since sliced bread and I'm selling it to you and you're going to love it. Immediately, your natural reaction is to put a wall up. But if I come to you and say, look, I'm not selling you. I don't want you to buy anything. I want to get your help. Can you help me and give some feedback from your expertise? That's a collaborative thing. And the most beautiful sound anyone can ever hear is their own voice. So if you can actually get that, then you get them to say, Hey, yeah, I like this. Okay, this solves a problem. Or no, I don't need it. Or I like this, but I wish it did this. Or, you know, maybe we could do that. What you're doing there, though, is that you're building a champion, somebody who, who helps you. So you're really going through ideas, but it's real world. And also you're getting direct feedback. And through that champion, they may say, you know what? And dude, you solve that problem. You come back and I'll buy them all day long. Because then you've got that in, they have, they have, they've had an impact in the outcome and they're going to help drive that success. Because if you adopt that, well, they don't want to be embarrassed and say, yeah, it was a stupid idea. I shouldn't have told you that. Mm -hmm. They may even give you referrals to other people down the road. It's, it's a, it's a really great, uh, 
point, I mean, there's a few real critical takeaways there. Um, in our first segment, we had Intuit uh, with their design for delight thinking process come in and they talked a lot about customer empathy. Um, and I mean, you hit the nail right on the head when you addressed the importance of taking that time to first uh, identify that problem. Um, as you're identifying that problem, um, connect with your customer as much as you possibly can or your potential customer. And I love how you mentioned uh, kind of keeping this 80%, 70 to 80% um, half-baked uh, because over time, these ideas have a way of self-expanding. Um, and when you look at your customer from a perspective of a partner or your potential customer, as you said, um, and you know, asking them for their feedback, they can help with that self-expanding approach, uh, which I think is really powerful. So Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about your book um, and the purpose of, of I know you address uh, your new book, uh, Living Life on Your Terms, um, but also the solopreneur. Um, and, and, you know, why you kind of chose those titles and those paths along the way in your entrepreneurial journey. Well, and I think we may touch on this in a minute, but um, the, the primary reason I, I, I wrote the book is that there are so many people who so many when you look at the statistics, it is absolutely frightening how many people fail in startups. And it doesn't have to be that way. People look at me and they say, oh, Kluber, you started 16 companies. Well, you, you must be a big risk taker. And I assure you, I am not. I am risk adverse. I'm willing to make a, a calculated risk when I'm comfortable with where I'm, I'm. There's a very good chance that I know the outcome. Uh, to me, though, the most dangerous thing for me would be to, to work someplace where my mouth could get me in trouble by a boss or I could step on somebody's toes. I mean, that to me is a, a quicker extinction event for my career than my ability to, to start businesses. So, so with that in mind, I thought about why is it that of all the companies I've had, I've only had one that went completely south. And that was because I got at loggerheads with Google. And, um, and with that, we did everything was white hat, but they decided they didn't like it. And they just banned us on the server level with 5,000 websites. Wow. In that particular case, you know, try and call God. It's impossible. You can't even find the phone number. So I, I, I learned some great lessons with that. But the reality is, is, is that all the other ones I've done have done have been reasonably successful with a couple exits in there. And so when I hear the statistics, I think the way that most people look at startup is wrong. And, and the other thing is that people have this image of a lone gunman out there having to solve the world's problems, figure it all out on their own. And, and I think that's wrong. So the intention with the aspiring solopreneur was, A, how do you go through and start creating a minimum viable product, defining what it is. But to start with, even before that, I think what's absolutely critical, particularly for the solopreneur world, is defining what success looks like for you on your terms. You know, the fact that I can live in the mountains and I'm gonna go skiing this afternoon, and I worked with the team in the UK, this morning, and I'm working with you in, um, in uh, or in Florida now, means that I've been able to define what I wanted as success for me, and I'm able to build my life around that. And I think if you do that first, because if you're only chasing dollars, you lose. Particularly for the Gen Zs and the Millennials. Now, I'm not saying they aren't important; they're they're very important, but it's not the only factor. And if you can define what success looks like for you. And then you can find something that you think you're going to have fun with and it's going to light you up and you're enthused about, then the likelihood of you being successful goes up just by those basic factors. So we start with the concept of starting there first, then move to the idea of how do we sort of smoke out and find out how other people are solving it. And then I go to the point of suggesting that you reach out and talk to people all over the country or the world. It has never, ever been easier to safely start and vet a business than it is today. You can call up and if, if somebody calls up and uh, you know kid calls me up that's in my same wheelhouse and says, hey, Mr. Old Guy, would you mind listening to me and giving me some advice? Of course I will do that. And if they don't, then go, go to the next one. But physically calling people on the phone helps to build that, vet that idea. And we still haven't left our job. 
We still are safe at where we are, but we're starting to define those things. So we're slowly stepping into it. Once you get closer with that, then you move through the process of creating an amazing board of advisors. And we can touch on this a little bit more, but there are people out there who can help you, that want to help you. It's their job to help you from a great small business account to a great business banker, to a great um, insurance person, to a marketing person. These people will give you time and help you start to build that out. So you have a whole team of advisors for almost no money. You can potentially get a mentor or two that are willing to help you and step those things in. And then if you go through, do the, the process I suggested, ideally you get a champion or two with your product or service to where when you decide to jump, it is a total no, no brainer. There's no question that when you start to transition in, but it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that so that we can A, define what success is for us, B, create that wonderful minimum viable product, C, build a board of advisors or team of advisors that are going to help you. Then how do we plan our, actually our launch and then pull the trigger? So with that, there's a, as an Omaha person, there's a Warren Buffett, wealthy guy there. Um, I really like his, his number two, Charlie Munger. And I, I, I go to all the meetings when they have him in Omaha. And one of my favorite quotes, and it's a paraphrase from, from Charlie was, you know, people look at Warren and I like we're really, we're these goose gurus or soothsayers. And he says, we're not. Those guys read almost eight hours a day. He says, we look at a lot of deals. Yeah. And when we find a great deal, we research it. And when it's a great deal, we do it. But we only do no brainers. And that to me is the biggest thing. I have probably done 2000 business plans. I have probably looked at 2000 different businesses, 5000 different businesses. But when it comes time to pull the trigger, I only do no brainers. So I kind of ramble a little bit there, James, but does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, I mean, that that's phenomenal. And uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about your roadmap in, in a minute here, but I want to touch on, on something you mentioned about risk, uh, because it, I think there's uh, a, a misconception for collegiate entrepreneurs in the sense that it's very hard to find, um, you know, an idea that would stick um, and kind of taking advantage of that opportunity. And then at some point along the way, finding a potential investor. Um, you talk about it, um, and from a, from a paraphrase of Warren's team, um, you know, looking at those no-brainers, right, and deciding on those no-brainers. Have you developed any type of uh, um, uh, process or algorithm or something that you internally do to look at deals um, and decide if it's a no-brainer for you. I know you talked about the importance of, you know, what success looks like and making sure that you maintain your freedom, which is excellent. Um, but, you know, just from a, a feasibility or a viability perspective, what are you looking for um, before you decide to sign on to a team? Well, um, and this may be an area where we, uh, I, I get nervous when I hear people start talking about fundraising. Mm-hmm. Candidly, if I'm talking to somebody in college and they even know the word tranche or a round or mm -hmm. I, I won't invest with them, mm -hmm. point blank, because at that point, people are becoming more enamored with the money yep. than with the output. I want somebody who's going to crush it. I would rather have somebody who comes in and says, this is what we're doing. And to me, to me, a no brainer is when somebody has that basic minimum viable product and somebody's paying them something for it. Yep, yep, yep. And, and that is so much easier than what people think. We don't, you, I, don't need, you don't need a big fancy office and ping pong tables and craft beer and culture. You need somebody who's going to buy your stuff. Right. And you have that. And, and because then when you have that and you're really solving a problem for them, then your financing opportunities explode. Mm -hmm. Because... If, if you're the bank, James, and I come in and I've got this idea and I've got this agreement for these people who are willing to pay me money for that idea, your likelihood of feeling more comfortable about lending me some money goes up. Mm -hmm. If that company's big enough, and I talk about this in the book as well, maybe 
maybe it's the end of the year and they need, they'll, they'll actually fund it. I've seen it where people, where the company, the contractor, the, the contractee will fund the business for the contractor to get started. We give them a, a, a better discount and we, we hit there. Or maybe there's, you got receivable. I mean, but there's a whole plethora of ways of doing it. You know, it's a no brainer when, you know, it's a no brainer when if you're married, you could go to your spouse and your spouse is like, oh my God, honey, that's no brainer. That's we're idiots if we don't do that. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest challenge I see with entrepreneurs when it comes to pulling the trigger is they're, they got too big of brains and they can figure out, well, if we did this and that happened and we can make this and it's just like, oh my God, no. Yeah. It, it Let that one go. There's going to be a thousand more behind. Mm -hmm. Find those ones where it's just like, and I, that's the last set of criteria in the book before the six month launch is, am I an idiot not to do this? That's kind of my, my, if it's like, yeah, or it's like, but if it's like, well, I'm not really sure, then don't, mm -hmm. there's going to be a bunch more behind it. So I don't know. Does that, does that answer that? Well, I, I, you really touched on something um, that uh, is, I think, um, misunderstood, but it's quite profound in that uh, feasibility. There's a study that we can conduct um, to, to make sure that a venture is feasible. Uh, but um, the other way of, of doing it is just finding customers and selling your service or your product to those individuals and repeating that process, refining that process along the way. Um, and, and a lot of times that's all the entrepreneur really needs in terms of funding. Um, you know, to your earlier point, I agree with you, um, a collegiate entrepreneur, somebody that has become obsessed with this thought process of I need funding to reach or, uh, any type of level of success um, uh, to launch my business, um, we disagree with. We think that uh, there's a, a great beauty to building a minimum viable product, launching that venture, uh, finding repeatable customers and growing it from that perspective, especially at the collegiate level. Um, so, you know, I, I really, when I read your book, um, I thought it was this perfect natural extension to what our students are learning in their classroom environments. Um, I like to think of a collegiate entrepreneur as operating in somewhat of a fail safe environment. Um, they don't have much to lose at this point in their entrepreneurial career. Um, once they graduate and they move on um, and they have a job and they have a, a lease or a mortgage or a car loan, um, you know, these things, all of these things start to make it more challenging and more uh, um, uh, oppressive to launching a venture. Um, so, you know, I think you touched briefly on your roadmap methodology, um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that um, as it relates to the solo entrepreneur, Chris. Okay. And do you mind if I go back to a couple points you made? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one thing, um, I, I want to be clear that I'm, I'm not against raising money mm -hmm. and I'm all over it. Mm -hmm. But when you're raising money, I just look at that money as gasoline mm -hmm. and that gasoline is getting thrown on a fire. So once you have a minimum viable product and you've, you've tested it and we've got two or three and we've gone through a few iterations and you're like, holy smokes, we got something here. Yeah. If somebody then comes to me and says, yeah, we need money. Okay. Why? Well, we need it for this specific reason in our marketing and growth, and we're going to do this with our coding and this. And we're going to, okay, that's a whole different ballgame. But it becomes the job when somebody's looking for money to make it so it's a no-brainer for me. Mm -hmm. And and what does that look like? And then we even we go through and we talk about smart money and dumb money. You know, do you want do you want money that's going to be relationships or is it just money? You know, is it? And, and understanding, you know, there, so there's a lot of different dynamics there. Now, you touched on something else there that I think is one of the unsung, um, it's one of my issues with, with education, no offense, but I think that the, the availability for really cheap money empowers so many students to become indentured servants to their debt without understanding the repercussions of that. So, the more, as an entrepreneur, the more you can live below your means, both with the type of debt you may have from college to cars, to house, to stuff, to everything, 
You know, if it's a $9 beer versus a PBR, drink the PBR. Put the extra four bucks in your pocket until you get ready. You know, it's, it's focusing on those types of things because it's going to be how long is your burn rate? Because no matter how beautiful and perfect and no brainer it is, you're going to hit road bumps and you need the cash. And as long as you have that, because going after money is a totally, totally separate business than actually driving and the success of actually getting. So James, what do you think of those things? Do you have any thoughts on those two? Yeah, I, I do agree. Um, and I look at it from a perspective of, uh, you know, many of the entrepreneurial ventures that uh, kind of spring at the collegiate level, um, those entrepreneurs tend to get really good at um, practicing things like standing up a fancy website um, and a great marketing plan. Um, a lot of times they go through a business model canvas uh, and they've done a lot of the appropriate legwork because it's what they've learned in their classes. Um, where they reach this analysis paralysis is the is the chase uh, for the customer. Um, and a lot of times uh, because they, they don't necessarily know how to network or connect and engage with their potential customer basis, um, the, the venture does not uh, move forward. And that's why I think these discussions are so important because when we start the design thinking process and the formation process around connecting with the customer, um, and making sure that you're building something for the customer, uh, it creates this additional emphasis on funding by way of sales. Um, and I think that for a lot of the types of ventures and industries that collegiate entrepreneurs tend to pursue, um, it really just comes down to that. Um, and I agree with you in terms of the, uh, you know, the fundraising. Um, it's always more powerful to have a plan and factual data um, you know, designating why the need for the raise is so important. Um, but again, I, I, I believe, and I think you would agree that having those customers and that traction is also a really meaningful component of the, uh, of that fundraise. Well, yeah, I, I, that to me is going to give you the best terms. Mm -hmm. And are there people who get, who get raised, who get money at, you know, at the conceptual idea once in a blue moon, but that is that is so rare that I, I don't I, that's just not something. And the thing is, is most likely those people are already well connected, mm -hmm. and they they had a pocket deal lined up in advance. Mm -hmm. Is how a lot of those things work. Yeah. So. Yeah. And again, going back to so the the new book, Living Life on Your Terms, it's a fable. It's an easy read, um, mm -hmm. but it's Life on Your Terms, and but it goes through in the in that particular story. It's a it's a 28 year old who's on a, on a quest to try and figure out where he wants to be in life. He's got a great job. What does it look like? And then it's a journey all the way through that. And then the very end, he's living as a, uh, as an IT consultant, living remotely out of his, out of his sprinter van, mm -hmm. traveling and riding his mountain bike for him. He won. Mm -hmm. And, and it's that kind of thinking that, that I think is important to get this started. But it also helps people start to build their chops on learning how, how to actually do business. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's only the young guys who are the successful entrepreneurs. Actually, if you look statistically, a lot of times it's the old guys because they've been through it and they've got so many road scars. Mm -hmm. And then and also, a lot of times it comes down to tenacity. I was able to get to, to study um, entrepreneurial strategy at a private group at Harvard Business School. And we did that uh, deep immersive at, at the, in Boston. And, and I found it absolutely fascinating because we did case studies for 12 hours a day. That's the kind of geek I am. I, I like that. But, you know, if you look and actually do the entire study of like Amazon, well, Amazon was a failure for almost 25 years. They went broke. It was a mess. So understanding that it's, it's the, the longevity and how do we start creating the clarity and knowledge that we can get better at those things and always be looking at it in a different way. So, yeah. all right. So, so you had said sort of questions around the roadmap itself. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so when we think about a roadmap, um, just like if anybody, you, they've all taken vacations, when you take a vacation, well, you don't just go get in the car and start driving and go, Oh, do I have my partner? Did we pack anything? Do we know where we're going? 
Do we have a hotel to stay at? No, we actually think about it. We have a destination of where we're looking for in mind. And that's where if you can start with what is that balanced life, that successful life look like for you as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, that ends up sort of as our starting point for a destination. And you'll be amazed at how often that's different. And if you guys want, I'll, actually, I'll send you a link. I've got an electronic tool that's called the balance wheel, but it's a way of doing a, a current assessment of where we are. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with who some of them make huge money. But let's say, let's say we're working with somebody and this gal owns her own neurosurgery practice and she's putting two million to the bottom line a year and she drives a Maserati and she has a beautiful second home and she's won every industry accolade there is. Well, on the outside, we'd say, wow, man, she's really successful. And, and by those standards, we, we would be right. But if that success is coming at the expense of her spouse feeling abandoned, and maybe he's not as faithful as he could be, or maybe his kids or her kids are feeling abandoned and they've got substance issues or they're acting out, or maybe she's so stressed out, the only way she sleeps is with a handful of Xanax every night. Well, if that's the case, then she's not very successful at all. So being able to help define that in advance, and that's something that old guys like me hardly ever looked at, but, and that's where something the Z's and the, the, and the millennials are good at looking at. But I think starting with that, hey, what does that destination look like? Where do I want to be? And once we know that, then it's going to, that's going to help become your true north. Mm -hmm. The next step in the roadmap is to start to define what it is you love. What's your wheelhouse? What lights you up? What makes you happy? And, and if you decide you want to be whatever cra crazy specific niche it is, but that's yours and you can own it, oh my God, you win. There's a, there's a hippie singer from the 60s named Jerry Garcia for a band called The Grateful Dead. And to paraphrase, to paraphrase Jerry Garcia, the goal isn't to be the best at what you do. And you have to remember, this was a guy who had literally hundreds of people that lived their life following them to wherever they played music, deadheads. Um, but the goal isn't to be the best at what you do. The goal is to be the only one who does what you do. When you can do that, then you can define your price and you can define what life looks like on your terms. And the fact that we can get in front of anybody on the planet right now empowers you to look in such different ways to solve those problems. But thinking outside the box what that is. Once we define that, then the next step is we wanna find others who've maybe done that before. Who's plowed that road? Who's got those sharp elbows? Who has those battle scars? And let's talk with them. Let's see how they solve it. And maybe they say nothing, but maybe they're going to have a bunch of good advice. Maybe they want to get rid of a business. Maybe they want to bring you under their wing. Who knows what it is, but start looking and exploring how it's being solved. Being open, receptive, doesn't mean that we're going to do it their way, but let's try and learn what we can from a spirit of curiosity to see where can we move forward? How can we improve? Once we start to do that, then we start to smoke out what our minimum bio product could be, whatever that is. If it's, a, if it's a service or a software or something like that, we can even come up with basic slides on what it could look like and just theoretically talk to people. But through that process, we're, we're, starting, to, we're starting to find champions. We're starting to clarify what we're doing. And then we move forward with that. So, so James, I'll pause there. Any, any thoughts or feedback on, on that first starting to that point? No, I agree. I, I think there's this, um, the importance, and you touched on it, of knowing yourself first. Um, I taught a uh, um, evaluating franchise opportunities course uh, last year at Rowan University. Um, and when we uh, went through the course, we looked at franchising as a method for growth. Um, and what I loved about the, the topic and, and as we were kind of diving deeper is that it really came down to what, the, what type of life the entrepreneur wanted to live. And franchising gave a very freedom-filled lifestyle for both the franchisor and franchisees. And that's just one example. Um, but I, I, I really like your um, kind of uh, focus there of, of peeling back your, 
your inner self and figuring out what type of life you want to live as you're evaluating the type of venture that you want to establish. Um, I think knowing yourself first really helps you identify your potential mentors, your advisors, and the type of people that are going to help move you forward in new venture creation. Okay, wonderful. And I agree. And uh, there's a chapter in there on franchises as well mm -hmm. and, and how to find the best if those are good fits. Sometimes they're a fantastic fit, but also making sure how you vet that and, and review that. Yeah. So, so then once we start to have our baseline um, product or service, okay, now we need to go in and really start to, to build out what's it going to cost. This is where we start hitting the numbers and we want to go through and we're going to talk to an insurance agent. Insurance agents are a, a good, now let me be clear on this. When I mention these people, they have to be somebody who's an expert in small business. And I have specific questions in the book on how you ask, how you vet somebody. But if you have a banker, uh, at bankers, as an example, it's illegal for them not to take your loan, your application. It's illegal for them not to talk to you. But their portfolios may say, we only do loans that are 10 million and above, that are well-seasoned businesses that are collateralized by um, real property. It, you're totally wasting your time. But if you can go in and talk to a banker and say, hey, what, what areas do you, is your sweet spot? How many loans did you make last year between 100 and 400 grand? How many loans have you done that are uncollateralized? How are we doing this? Because when you find that banker, that banker is going to help, is going to be a great resource because then they're a partner with you and want to help drive your success. It's not just making the loan. So I usually start when we're looking at this with either an attorney or an accountant, but a great attorney who understands small business, not the guy who helped with the divorce or buy your house. Doesn't mean they aren't great, but they aren't in this space. When I was a business intermediary, making sure that we had quality bankers on the sides made the world a whole lot easier. <laughs> they can figure it out. But instead of getting them to figure it out, I want somebody who's already done it 50 times and is going to tell me the right way to do it. Same thing with your, with your accountant. Really good small business accountants understand how to help you. They know they can see around the corners because they've seen under the covers in thousands of businesses. They may even know people that they can invite you into strategic partnerships or somebody to talk to who could be an advisor or somebody who could give you overflow work. Or again, there's a hundred different ways to, to build on that, but get them to start understanding what's this going to cost? What do I need to be aware of? Where are we at with this? Same thing then with your attorney, same process. Any good quality attorney, um, a banker, accountant will give you a minimum of 30 minutes. They should give you an hour because you have to remember that they're in business development as well. And you're a client for them. But remember, they work for you. Make sure that your values are in alignment, that you guys are on the same page. Could be the best attorney in the world, but if you don't like each other, that's not going to work. Find somebody that you really can trust and truly believe in. But we start building this board of advisors, this team of advisors, and they're going to start asking questions all sorts, all the way down the, the pipe. And it's going to lead to different questions that are going to lead for you to keep digging and digging and digging and digging and going down the rabbit hole. And as you smoke all this stuff out, you're going to start to see, are there opportunities or is this already saturated or is this just not viable? You know, I thought I could, I thought I could charge 400 an hour, but by the time I factor in all this crap, holy crap, I got to be at 700 an hour you know, or whatever it is. But you start to smoke those things out. This is a way of actually the intention, the spoiler in the book is that when you get to the end, you have an amazing business plan that you've actually inadvertently built because you've done it with intention all the way through to determine, is this really real? And once you have those things, then you can start to present it. So, so, so there's, the, there's the, we have the minimum viable product piece. We've talked to people, we've created, and we've started to smoke out what the process and the people are out there so that what is this gonna look like? How are we gonna do our accounting or bookkeeping or legal, all this stuff together? And we're building a team that we can trust. We may end up paying them, but hell, if you can pay somebody for 200 bucks an hour, but you only have to hire them one hour a month, great. Yeah. 
you know? So yeah. James, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I love, I love that, Chris. Um, you know, one of the things that I often find is that uh, I think some of the programming um, that is out there to help a collegiate entrepreneur can often demonstrate to a collegiate entrepreneur um, how little they know about launching a venture. Uh, and I think that that uh, kind of brings us to this um, this freeze moment or this paralysis moment of, wow, I know nothing about legal and I just don't feel comfortable stepping forward into launching this business because it seems very overwhelming. Um, and I like how you reference bankers, lawyers, insurance brokers as advisors. Uh, because if you find the right one and you start developing that relationship, um, which by the way, you might be able to connect with a future accountant or a future banker in your classes. Um, you know, and, and connecting with them um, at these early stages, um, it really does become an advisory um, borderline friendship uh, because they're willing to um, kind of help you through these uh, more difficult challenges and knowing yourself first and knowing what you're really good at and what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with um, is a great way for the individual entrepreneur to take that step forward and gain that additional success um, and that guidance that they need. Kind of filling those voids of, wow, I know nothing about legal, but I'm going to lean on my lawyer um, to help me through that. So one of the greatest gifts I had was the fact that I took accounting 401 four times and got through with a D. <laughs> because um, I am extremely dyslexic, especially with numbers. So I knew, no questions asked, that I was going to have to have good bookkeepers and accountant right off the bat. It was one of those things, again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And being able to find people who can help us and empower us to be great at those things, that's awesome. I've got my gifts that nobody else has. I want to find other people's gifts and get them to be great at it. Yeah. Now, if your business can't afford it, then I would really challenge you to say, is that a good viable business? Mm -hmm. Because at a certain point, we have to make sure that we understand that. Same respect with the government. You know, I used to spend so much time figuring out how to nickel and dime and get away with all sorts of creative accounting, legal, but every, you know, this tax credit and that and all this other. And, and the reality is, is just your business you have to plan that you just make the government a partner. And if the business is viable at that point, then it's going to be a hell of a lot easier. Then if you find some of those other things, you can't. Right. But the big thing I want to point out on this roadmap is that you can do all of this today as a student and it costs you nothing. You can get into this point with zero money, except your time. Now remember time, talent, treasure, only three things in the world we can leverage. Our, our talent, our, our treasure is what everybody focuses on. That's money, stuff, all the things. It's the most fictitious. It, we can leverage it. We can steal it. We can borrow it. And candidly, it's an illusion. Once you get to a certain point, it is very illusional. I, it's hard to believe, but it's true. The second is our talent. That's the one thing that as long as we don't lose our marbles, we can always be improving that nobody can take. But time, time is the one thing that people are, are most... Um, cavalier with. Oh, we're killing time. We're wasting time. But it's the most valuable asset because it decreases every second. So how can we make sure that it's very, very precious and, and that we stay very present in whatever we're doing? But you can get to this whole point without launching. And the ideal is that then we start finding a couple people that become champions. There's a whole checklist in the book on is should we do this? Do we have the money? Is the time frame? What is this? What are these things? No brainer, no brainer, no brainer, right. no brainer, no brainer. Right. No. But then if you can have two or three champions, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen this, to where, yeah, you can start moonlighting. I'm working with one client part-time, four hours a week. Then I'm working with two clients for eight hours, four clients for 16 hours. All right, now I can jump. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of very, 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 very intentionally transitioning to those spots so that then you're truly living life on your terms. That's the whole intention with that. Mm -hmm. So that I, I ramble a little bit there, James, but does that sort of outline the, the roadmap? 
That's great, and it and it brings such a such a unique individuality uh, to the entrepreneurial journey. Um, and it seems like you know your entrepreneurial journey has been so um, exceptionally individual. Um, when we talked about this session, you you warned me. You said, "Well, James, I have a very different viewpoint on business feasibility uh, and viability." Um, and I'd love to hear that. I'd love to, you know to share that with today's audience. Um, clearly, you've worked with many entrepreneurs at, at all different levels. You know, how did you formulate this alternate? Uh, perception? Um, you know, what was that aha moment um, that you took away from these interactions? It was actually when I wrote the book, when okay. I realized that it was very much, this can be done very methodically, very intentionally, very step-by-step. Step. The, the traditional myth that is highlighted by most people on what an entrepreneur is, is it's somebody who stays up all day and night drinking Red Bull, getting all jacked up, and they put everything, they go all in, it's all in, it's all or nothing. And they put everything on there and they're probably gonna fail. And there's all this drama around there. And, and that's where, and, and sometimes that's there. And don't get me wrong, I have worked more than my share, fair share of a hundred hour weeks. Right. But if it's something that you love and you're passionate about and you've got purpose and you know that it's successful, it takes all that other stress and BS away. There's a CEO of a billion dollar organization that I coach, and he literally just right before this emailed me. And he, when we talk, the first thing he says every time is he tells me about how his sleep is. Mm. Because I challenged him for the first year of our engagements to tell me how your sleep was. And he's like, look, I'm fine. I'm at six hours. I got four hours. And it's like, you're not you're not going to be able to be your best self to make the best decisions to elevate out. So, so coming back, I, I have a perception that most people think of entrepreneurship as this lone gunman out there by themselves, all in, you know, it's really scary and you're probably going to fail. And to me, it comes down to how do we take all of that fear away? How do we surround ourselves with people that love and trust us? And when we get ready to step, it ends up being a flawless, seamless, holy smokes, I'm so happy with where this is. How can I turn back and do this for somebody else and right. get that long in a bigger way? Right. That's fantastic. Uh, so uh, we're, we're coming up here on um, just a few more minutes before we'll open it up for questions. Uh, when we do that, uh, I do encourage you to turn on your cameras and your microphones um, so that we can see your beautiful face um, and chat with you uh, directly. Uh, but uh, before we do that, Chris, uh, we talked about uh, these, these teams of advisors. Um, at what point would you say uh, a collegiate entrepreneur, right? They may not have access to uh, banking um, relationships yet, or um, they may have not, you know, they're not in the space of, you know, regularly interacting with business professionals. When would you say the entrepreneur should start going after, you know, assembling that team of advisors? I know we talked about it on the roadmap, but could you, could you laser point, uh, you know, a, a specific time or a moment in their venture process that they should consider that? Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. So once, once somebody starts, they've talked with other experts in their field and they're starting to smoke out an idea of what their minimum viable product should be. Okay. That's it right then. And I don't care if you're 18 years old or if you're 80 years old, if you start to have a minimum viable product and you think it's close or you think you're getting there and you've got somebody who's like, you know, I'm kind of interested in this. Mm -hmm. You come up with that and I, I would give you money to do this. All right. That's, that's getting close. Mm -hmm. And at that point, because it isn't necessarily, it, it can take a little bit of time. You have to be very, very proactive and intentional when interviewing. Now, it may be counterintuitive to say, well, I'm a 19 year old kid and I'm going to go interview attorneys about business. But the questions in the book, you're interviewing them. And most attorneys, bankers, accountants are going to sit back and act like, oh, it's a privilege for you to talk to me. If that's the case, thank you so much for your time, sir. I got to go. And keep going until you find somebody who's interested. The right one will get, they'll get a kick out of you asking them questions. They'll get a kick out of you hotboxing them. 
they mm -hmm. will love it. And you can have, and when you start to have that person as your advisor, then your world can change. Mm -hmm. Because if you can, if they're willing to receive that, then they're going to go, James, what, what are you thinking, man? You're being an idiot with this. Mm -hmm. What about that? What about mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. I don't want somebody that's going to tell me I'm always right. I right. want somebody, I, dude, I think you got a big blind spot here. Okay, help me understand this. Right. Now, it doesn't mean you go in with swagger and a bunch of attitude. It means that you go in very respectful, but know that you're interviewing right. people for a job and talking to them. And if it means you talk to five of them, 10 of them, fine. But age should be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. now, anything should be irrelevant. If you've got a great idea, I don't care what you sound like, what you look like, where you're from, what you think. Do you have a great idea? And is that person when you find the right business? And, you know, you can do a lot of this just on initial phone calls. But stereotype, I think this is an area that millennials and Zs do have to get out of their comfort zone. And remember that, that these things actually call people, call and physically talk to them. Don't yeah. send them an email or a text or expect, no, physically call and talk to them. It's going to be a skill that'll, that'll pay dividends for the rest of your life is actually speaking with people. Yeah. So does that answer that, James? It does. Yeah. And, and the last thing I want to touch on before we dive into questions, um, because I think that this is really important. Uh, when I teach my classes, one of the things that there are two things that students often say, I always ask one question, you know, why are you not launching a business right now? The first is funding and the second is time. Uh, you know, they're, they're too busy with their classwork. And I often think back to my time in college and man, I wish that's all I had on my plate today. Uh, so I often find that um, entrepreneurs have this ability and you talk about in your book, this ability to expand bandwidth. Um, and there's always, you know, more available, but you're always making a, a sacrifice for that bandwidth. And that's really what it is. Um, you know, what's your take on that? Um, when does the entrepreneur or, um, you know, how capable is the entrepreneur uh, of expending their available bandwidth, uh, making more available and, and kind of giving up, um, you know, certain parts of their life to do so? I'm thinking on that. Um, so where my head goes is Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, um, Michael Dell, Mark Cuban, besides being incredibly financially successful, have a common trait. They all read three to eight hours a day, mm -hmm. every day. So when you take that into account, how on earth can these guys afford the time to do that? Well, going back to talent, they figured that that's the most important thing is for them to sharpen the saw. When it comes to it, we all have the same amount of time. And the sooner we can learn how to manage our time, the better it's going to be. So when it comes down to bandwidth, I actually suggest instead of trying to expand our bandwidth, we try and narrow our focus. The more you can narrow your focus, the more laser focused you can be in whatever you're doing, the more present you can be, the more you will get done. If you've ever experienced a state of flow, you can, I've, I've been in flow where I could do nine hours worth of work in an hour because I turned my phone off, because I allowed myself to get in there and I trusted that I was going to be okay when I was in there. So I think the greatest gift we can give ourselves and we can give anybody else is to be 100% present. So when you're with somebody, do everything you can to look right into their soul. Be curious, try and understand, really engaged. And when you do that, you can get done in five minutes what normally takes an hour. So by that nature, the more you narrow down and focus, I believe the more you expand what you're capable of. And I mean this in the same way when you're screwing around. If you're going out and playing, I want you to turn your phones off and just get in it and just get silly and fully embrace with whatever screwing around you're doing. But the more you can embrace that, the more you're going to get out of everything. And I believe is going to expand 
the what you can get done. But James, what do you think to that? That's a, again a different way. I, I agree. Do. You know, it's it's almost uh, you use the phrase narrow uh, your focus. Um, I and I would expand upon that and say if you need to expand your bandwidth, you narrow your focus to expand your bandwidth. Uh, exactly. Because I, you know, I think uh, we as entrepreneurs are. Um, man, our minds are just thirsty, right? We're constantly looking for, for new, new things uh, to explore, new opportunities. It's like a sponge. Uh, we walk through life with these antennas. Uh, it's so interesting uh, how the entrepreneur uh, reacts to distractions um, and how important it is for us to be mindful of the fact that humans cannot multitask. Uh, we switch from one task to the next, but we're not effectively doing two tasks at once, even when we try to. Um, so it's important to you know, avoid those distractions and try and kind of bring in that focus. I, I love that thought process, Chris. Uh, so so at, at, go ahead. Can I expand on that real quick? Yes, please, yeah. It's, it's one of the things that I teach when I'm doing my senior advisory work is not only can we only do one task at a time, but if you're doing anything that, that has deep cognitive work, mm -hmm. more than that, you lose two thirds. So, so if you bounce out for a minute, you lose another three minutes mm -hmm. getting back into the same cognitive depth that you were on something. So every time the goddamn, excuse me, the phone vibrates mm -hmm. or every time something bings or you get distracted or you check something, you're not losing the time, you're losing that times four. And if you start factoring that in, universally, if, if, you, if you do not, I, I carried a pager for a long time to where I turn my phone off for eight, nine hours at a time so that when I'm there, you can be ultra, ultra present. But the phones are specifically designed by people who've done a lot in Las Vegas to distract us with dopamine hits and all sorts of Pavlovian hits that come in different ways. So that's one of my sort of pet peeves. So I, thank you for letting me jump in on that one. Yeah, of course. Well, what I'd like to do right now, um, and as a reminder, uh, once we wrap up with Q&A for Chris, uh, Logan is going to demonstrate to us a software that we're making available to the CEO network, uh, which will actually help you work through a feasibility study. Um, it's quite unique and pretty exciting. So uh, I'd like to open it up now to the audience for questions uh, for Chris. Uh, again, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat or um, go ahead and turn on your camera and microphone so that we can um, interact with you directly. And Chris, we're monitoring the chat for you. Um, I think we covered a lot of really great topics today, so we may be question free. <laughs> or, or it was a little boring, one of the two. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I deeply enjoyed the discussion. So skiing this afternoon, Chris, I'm an avid skier myself. Wonderful. Well, uh, so we, uh, where we are, um, we've got a couple ski areas close, but I only do backcountry. We're at about okay. 10,000 feet. And then uh, we, uh, I like to go out and just, it, for me, for me, I recharge my batteries when I'm in the backcountry. It's nice and quiet. That goes along. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I frequent uh, uh, Mont Tremblant in uh, Canada, um, and that is a, a phenomenal, uh, uh, real serious mountain, which is uh, super fun. Um, so we'll do a last call here for any questions for Chris. Um, Does anybody have any businesses they're currently building? I get fifteen hundred bucks an hour, man. You're welcome to fire away for some free call, free free questions if you got them. You don't have to. <laughs> it looks like Mardine uh, does have a business uh, that they're currently building. Um, if anybody has any questions for Chris, uh, please ask them now. So I'm. I was thinking, James, the other day. Um, I originally met you uh, through uh, JD Messenger. That's I'm right. Still talking to me here and there, uh, quite a bit actually, um, but enjoyed coming down to the conference and talking through the, and, and we were, I started, it's where I sort of was working on the life on your terms out, outline then and redid a couple of books since then. So that was fun. 
Thank you for coming. Uh, we had a blast. So, uh, Anas, did you have a question? Yeah, hi. Um, first and foremost, Chris, thank you so much. That was very informational. Um, I guess a question I had was regarding the Board of Advisors. Um, you mentioned the importance of having a Board of Advisors whenever you get close to an MVP. And I don't really understand like the scale of what the project kind of needs to be like. Does the scale even matter when you're going to establish a Board of Advisors? I don't think the scale, of, it, and it doesn't have to be a formal board, and it doesn't have to be uptight. But if you decided you wanted to start a, a three-person lawn mowing business, find accountants who know that space and talk to the accountant, and they'll give you a bunch of advice that'll be very helpful. And then talk to people who are already doing it in different ways, and talk to a talk to a, an accountant or talk to your banker, talk to the insurance. I mean, those people are there. When I say board, it's not necessarily sitting down in a boardroom and having formal minutes and it doesn't have to be uptight. It's just like call them up and say, hey, dude, I, I'm looking at doing this. Can you help me with this? Where, what do you think? Where are the blind spots? What's out there? But I, I think it can genuinely help you get through. Uh, it can help you. The main goal for that is to help you find the blind spots and to James's point, give you comfort that you don't have to know everything. Because if you think you have to know everything, you're going to lose sleep because there's no way it's going to happen. But if we can get other people to help us with that, then that's going to start to streamline that. So definitely, you, I agree. Do you have something in mind, or um, in mind in terms of uh, uh, what business, or that, that, does that answer that question for you? Yeah, that answers the question. Um, to answer your question, I'm just a student. Uh, I'm currently attending Illinois Institute of Technology. I'm trying to learn more about. Um, entrepreneurialism, and I'm trying to get into it. And yeah, that's that's all. Okay. And the thing is, is is just start looking at what you love, and see how it's getting solved, and find out where it's annoyed. I mean, do you guys know where Facebook originated? You probably do. But Facebook originated because Zuckerberg wasn't getting dates, and he got shut down by some people. So he created something where he could unlike people. I wish I could say it was more complex, but I don't know that that it was. It is more complex, but high level, that's sort of what was, he was solving a problem is that he wasn't popular. So it frustrated him. Yeah. So. Thank you, Anas. Uh, Peter, did you have a question or a, a thought? Yes. Uh, yes, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. I took down a lot of notes actually. And then I was just looking through what questions I need to ask. Um, I think in, uh, in relation to what you were talking about that you don't need to know any, everything, uh, like you said, to take calculated risks um, and versus risks. So I just wanted to know, could you elaborate more on like, um, you know, have you taken a non-calculated risk that worked in a sense? I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, uh, uh, supporting that idea necessarily, but just to get the sense of idea, because like, you know, you said you don't have to know everything in a sense, but uh, when is appropriate calculated risks uh, appropriate? So I've got a pretty simple rubric for that, Peter, and thank you for the question. I'm grateful for that. Um, to me, it comes down to, if it was your money, if you're trying to get a hundred grand and it's the last hundred grand you have, would you loan it to yourself? That's gonna give you a fairly comfortable level of like, hmm, yeah, no, I, I, I think, no, that, that, that to me right there tells me how, how much you believe in it. So, so if you're pretty comfortable with it, if not, man, geez, man, I might lose that. Ugh, that's harsh. Okay, then how do you find some more to figure it out? How do you go all the way to potentially getting a contract? How do you get it to where it's just like, because if you, if you got to a point where you have a product and you have somebody who wants to deliver that and, and wants that product, and they'll say, look, yeah, we'll sign this agreement contingent upon you getting it started. You get it done, we'll give you the money. And you can do this. It's hard, but you can do it. And it's like, geez, if I, if I supply these people with this, I'm going to make $100,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's a no-brainer to give them money for that. That, to me, is a very calculated risk. Are there things that could jump up? Possibly. But ideally, you've mitigated almost all of your, all of your risk to get it started. Now, where you rub, come against a rub with that is if you have a much bigger project that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And how do you come up with the minimal viable version of that? And you may need some funding to get started in that. But 
if you think it's your money, are you willing to do it? That's sort of that cornerstone of how valuable something is or isn't. Does that answer that for you, Peter? That's a unique perspective. Thank you so much. Yeah, that actually does. Yeah, it does answer my question. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Nylesha, did I pronounce that correctly? Probably not. <laughs> it's Nylesha. Nylesha, uh, go ahead, ask your question. So I just wanna introduce myself first. My name is Nylesha Kelly. Um, I'm a junior at Bowie State University in Maryland. Um, currently I'm in an entrepreneurial academy right now and I'm kind of having a hard time only because um, most of my fellows are up and coming, you know, peers of mine that are already having like a starting business, whether it's with clothing lines, um, you know, the different cosmetics, um, things on that nature. I'm also studying marketing as well. So I'm trying to really tie in marketing with entrepreneurship. And I know that you can, but I'm really just trying to, I guess, find my way of how to build my own upcoming business or just to somehow, you know, present myself. Do you have any advice for me? Or I know you're not probably very familiar with the marketing side per se, but if you have any advice, it'd be really great to hear. I, uh, I exited out of a social media company where we did social media management and uh, content creation for companies from New York to Indonesia about six years ago. So I got a little flavor of it. Um, Nalesia, what I would suggest for you more than anything is are you clear on who you're looking for and what great looks like? Do you know somebody else out there that's crushing it? You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. So I'm not really super familiar. Um, right now, I am working with uh, Coca-Cola, um, multiple businesses with that um, in the marketing region. I have an internship with them this summer, but I've got to know them and got to really understand the business on that side. Okay. So where I'm thinking is, is if you have a wheelhouse, you mentioned cosmetics and clothing and things like that. My first company was clothing design, manufacturing, and wholesale. So brutal business, just, just two cents worth. It is a cutthroat business. But if you can find decision influencers already in that space that you like, whatever lights you up, start finding out who those people are and start approaching them and say, I love what you're doing and I'm looking at doing this. Would you have some time to talk to me? And if they say no, fine, kick it down the road, find somebody else. But there's somebody out there who can help you negotiate that. At this point, your obligation for yourself is A, to define where you think you want to go. And you may not know for years or 10 years, but start driving on that. Start challenging yourself and see if you can find somebody who's kind of doing a decent job of it now and figure out, is there a way that we can sort of lean in and try and push on that? Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Because there's no wrong answer. It's just a matter of figuring out the different ways to look at it. And I think, I know of people who've integrated marketing and that's become their business. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are phenomenal at marketing and as in turn, they can have a great entrepreneurial business that comes out of that. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. You bet. And uh, Chris, we have time for one more question. Um, so it looks like uh, Marlene is up. It's Marlene, but hi, um, Chris. Word. Thank you for the information. It was actually very helpful. So my question is, is um, how would you find the balance when you're starting up your business? Because for me, mine is a graphic design service business. And with me, like you said, you would need the actual effort and time to get that started. But with, with how you got started, how did you find that balance? Oh, when I got started, I was a train wreck. I had no balance. I was all in. It was a mess. Doesn't mean it was right, though. <laughs> so I think I think the, the key is for you, again, figuring out what, where you are and what lights you up, and then start figuring out what your time's worth and lean into that. So if you're looking at specifically like a service-based business, like a graphics, yeah. graphics design service business, if I were in your shoes and I'm starting a new business, I would stay laser, ultra-focused on giving the absolute best product and service you can for the individuals you work with. I would rather you work with two or three people and just blow their socks off. So it is such amazing and so impactful because then it means that you're going to be able to raise your value and you're going to be able to raise your fee. You're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger with who you are. 
So the idea is how can you do more, but with less time? And, and, and while you're starting it, sometimes finding this balance, you're gonna have to decide how much time do I have here? But again, putting that very clear intentionality around it. So, you know, you may say, all right, I, how much time do I watch television? I try not to watch TV anymore. But if you say, all right, well, geez, I hate to say it, I watched 12 hours of TV last week. All right, what if you said, I'm gonna trade my TV time for building my business time? And just do that for two weeks and see what I can get done. But stay laser focused in those time blocks at an hour at a time, everything's off, focused and build, and then come back and see what you can do. But between those two things, one, laser focused on, on where you need to be and investing that time. And then two, whoever you happen to be working with, do everything you can to change their life, change their world. Just be the absolute best work you can. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But stay focused on those two things. That, to me, is going to start to, to get the flywheel spinning for you so you build the business a little bit faster. Does that make sense? It does. Thank does you. that help at all, or did I just talk? No, it did. It actually did. Okay. Actually did. You're expecting it like, oh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yeah. better than the other answers I've gotten from other people. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Right. Good. Thank you. Awesome. So, and again, take them all with a grain of salt. Figure out what brand works for you and pull each little piece out that fits and make your own. Well, Chris, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, first of all, this has been our first uh, time at really kind of having a deep discussion, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, um, and I know that our uh, attendees have as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Chris. My pleasure. And uh, Sylvia, it's nice to see you again. I saw your, uh, your note there. So yeah. it's, uh, it's lovely that you were there, and I'm grateful you were able. That was 2019. Holy smoke. Yeah. I so know. It guys, seems like forever ago. Uh, James, I will uh, see if I can send over that balance wheel as a starting point for you guys. That's great. And we always send out a follow-up email uh, once the uh, video for the uh, segment is done. Uh, so we'll include that as well. Thank you, Chris. You bet. Thank you, guys. Have a great awesome. day. And uh, now, without further ado, I'd really like to uh, invite Logan um, to turn on his camera here uh, and talk a little bit about Open Ocean. Uh, again, this is a really fantastic software that I've had it. Uh, well, Logan, I've had a chance to look at it um, in its prior iterations, but I know that you have uh, continued to build it um, and build it out. And uh, as you know, this boot camp is really help, uh, designed to help the student um, kind of go through the process of knowing themselves, kind of building that idea, becoming an entrepreneur, uh, all of the above. And I think what you've built uh, with Open Ocean is a great tool uh, to help the entrepreneur take that next step um, and really figure out what's next for them um, and if their business model makes sense. Uh, so you have the floor uh, for about 15 minutes or so uh, and uh, happy to jump in uh, anywhere along the way. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing me here. Thanks, Chris, for uh, sharing all of that wisdom there. I, I'd love to like touch upon some of the things that you, you were talking about throughout that entire conversation and how it actually relates back to Open Ocean. Um, most recently, one of the, the things that we just talked about, I think Peter was the one that brought it up, was like the, the question of, of your advisory board and, and more informally like the the mentors and coaches that you're reaching out to and getting advice from um and and that was really one of the initial questions probably right when i was his age if like two or three years ago that that i was struggling with as an as an early stage entrepreneur and i wanted to to find who i should be talking to uh, about my business and, and make sure that I was getting the right feedback for, uh, in the right places at the right times. Um, so Open Ocean, I guess I'll show you guys quickly what the platform is and, and what it does. Um, it is a social networking platform geared towards entrepreneurs uh, built for people like us who like to help each other and like to start things and, and create new uh, business ideas. And it, and it helps us not only connect with one another, but connect for a, a meaningful purpose. Um, and I think that was something that Chris was talking about was that uh, entrepreneurs are, are happy to help one another. And, and I think that's the most unique thing about uh, entrepreneurs from, from all other types of people is that we like to 
support people uh, be, because somebody probably paid it forward to us at one point in time. So um, without showing you kind of everything that's on the platform, uh, I'd like to just kind of point out the, the thing that is, is most important about our network is that it focuses on how we can help each other. So uh, it lets you identify the, the things that you're able to support other users with. And sorry, it's glitching out a little bit right now. I'm on video, but uh, the things that you can provide support to other uh, users with. So like Chris said, if he uh, wants to get support from a lawyer or an accountant or somebody else on our network, I uh, can just connect with them here and log into what we have built as the Venture Vault. So um, when you get onto our platform, uh, everything that you'd be using for what uh, is going to be your business is located in the Venture Vault. So uh, the Venture Vault is essentially a place where you go through a step-by-step -step process to work on your business idea. So um, once you come in here, uh, I'll, I'll give everyone a, a link to sign up and, and create an account. Um, you can start working through the, the four different parts that we have. And ideation is probably a lot of the things that this boot camp was all about. So uh, getting started is the, the things that are your basic idea is all about, the, the name, the logo, legal structure, uh, going through the, the background of how you came up with the idea and the problem and solution you're trying to solve and, and the opportunity. And, and you really just go through all these things. Eventually, the research that you're going to be doing um, as far as your market and industry and competitive analysis, uh, you create a strategy for, for how you want to formulate your business idea and, and all the different moving pieces that it would incorporate. And, and really, as you're going through all of these steps, uh, the important part is that you can you can get you can provide updates on on the things that you're working on, such as your revenues and your expenses or uh, customers you're talking to, and uh, provide updates to your mentors and coaches as well. Also, you have access to some different resources, uh, digital tools that that we've uh, partnered up with, and finally uh, the coaches that are available to you. So. Uh, by joining through CEO, you'll be able to have access to me, uh, James, and, and a couple other coaches that uh, are going to be providing feedback on your business ideas if you, if you choose to put them through our, our process here. So um, just really quickly, the last thing I, got, I want to show you is, is how one of these steps would work. So essentially, it, it it's pretty simple. Uh, it works as like forms. Uh, generally, you just go through, you come up with the name of your business or whatever information you have already for your business and just fill it into these templates. Um, and, and as you go through, you mark them off as needs review. And that's when one of us uh, as the coaches will be able to see what you put in here, give you some feedback um, and, and go from there. So that's, uh, that's what our platform does. And, and as James mentioned, and as you could probably see, we are still in our very early stages. So we started uh, just about a year ago and, and we're doing a lot of um, updates and, and changes to our platform as, as we go. So I think what, what was awesome about this opportunity is that I was in your shoes uh, less than two years ago, uh, actually just about a year ago and, and coming up with this idea. So it's awesome to be able to get through the, the initial validation and, and finding some of our first customers and beta users and uh, being able to, to use it with, with people that are uh, trying to do the same thing on, on a different level. Yeah, Logan, thank you so much for uh, kind of walking uh, our audience through that today. Um, and please do drop, I see you already dropped yeah. it in there for the sign up. Um, and for everybody here, I, I know that Logan is definitely looking for people to test it and uh, play with it and maybe find some breaks uh, so that he can make it better. Um, although I don't expect many, uh, and we're definitely looking forward to you utilizing this uh, software um, as you're going through the business formation process. Um, like Logan said, we have accounts there too. And uh, when uh, you need review or guidance, um, we're happy to jump in. So um, Logan, if you don't have anything uh, else you'd like to add, um, we'll uh, go ahead. 
Yeah, well, so I, I, I have um, a code for everyone to use when they sign up and um, some different information as to how to get their account set up so that uh, they're connected to CEO and the coaches that I are will we'll be putting together to provide feedback to them. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of share that with you so you can put in that uh, following email. Um, yes. And then also the other thing I wanted to add in is we're going to be doing a, a drawing from all the, the students that sign up today. So um, I have all the people that sign up and actually go through the first part of our venture vault process. Um, We'll, we'll be giving away a, a gift card uh, of their choice. So um, we'll, be, we'll be drawing that as, as soon as we get everyone on the platform and, and we'll reach out to you on OpenOcean to uh, let you know who won. Awesome. Thank you very much, Logan. And uh, we do have a question here from Sylvia. She's one of our faculty advisors at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Um, and she's wondering if this is a tool that she could use with her students who are adopting real projects or startups. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you more, Sylvia, because um, the other side of our platform is geared towards organizations like CEO and incubators and accelerators um, to help them track the progress of the entrepreneurs that are that are on our platform and, and provide feedback and, and work with their mentors and coaches and resources that they provide. So I, I can uh, reach out to you after this. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, my students actually work through the semester with real uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, they adopt, this is uh, my, my program, Adopt a Startup. And so they work or collaborate with the engineering projects to across disciplines. So they uh, do all the business formation through my courses, but I was wondering if this uh, could be um, something they can um, input all the info to develop their own projects, but the companies are not theirs. That's why I am a little bit concerned, but we will talk later uh, about it, or if you wanna say something about that, because the companies belong to so somebody else. I'm just, concern about intellectual property or data, uh, sensitive data. Uh, what about the info that we that you will be collecting? Uh, do you have a DNA or um, yeah. a, a, an NDA? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so as far as like all the intellectual property, um, that every user stores their own um, intellectual property for their venture and it's their choice to share it with other people. So I guess, for example, if one of your students was putting another company's um, information onto our platform, uh, they would probably want to get the permission of that company um, so that they, they're aware that the information will be shared with um, you like the other mentors and, and coaches that they would potentially be sharing it to, but uh, it's up to them who they would share it to. Awesome, thank you so much. Sure thing. Excellent, well, I, I think that that will conclude today's segment. Logan, thank you again. Um, this is going to be uh, made available via recording uh, and we'll be sending it out to all of the attendees um, uh, likely sometime tomorrow. Uh, not only the attendees, but those uh, that also registered because we know that uh, timing can often be challenging. So next week, uh, same time, same place, uh, we will be addressing customers uh, and have we built something that they want. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. 